Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I would like to welcome you in another INDUST webinar. Uh, today, we are very happy to have with us Anna Vukovic, uh, and we will talk about High Resolution Global Task Source Map. Um, I would like to briefly introduce Anna. Uh, so, Anna Vukovic is an associate professor at the University of Belgrade. Her main expertise is related to numerical modeling of atmospheric processes and their interaction with land surface, uh, including uh, airborne dust transport. She also participates in the INDUST cost, ac cost action. She is actually the leader of the working package related to modeling. And she is also a science policy interface for the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. She also participates in development studies and policy recommendations related to land degradation, desertification, and land climate interactions. Uh, so before giving the floor to Anna to start her presentation, I would like to remind you that uh, you can use the question box to leave your questions throughout the, the webinar. And um, I, would, I would advise you to, um, to, to write your questions throughout the whole duration of the presentation and to not wait for, for the very last moment. So at the end of Anna's presentation, we will have um, uh, a questions round. Um, and with that being said, I would like to give the floor to Anna, and I would also like to thank her for, for preparing this presentation for us today. So, Anna, the floor is yours. Okay, thanks, Constantina. Uh, I will talk today about uh, efforts uh, uh, to obtain, actually, this high-resolution global dust source map. Uh, I will talk more about the, the methodology that led to the results, uh, and at the end, I will show, in short, uh, the results, uh, actually, this global dust source map or maps. You will see what I'm talking about. Um, uh, at first, uh, as an introduction, uh, this dust source map, uh, high resolution, meaning on 30 arc seconds resolution, uh, is called uh, uh, Global Sand and Dust Storms uh, Source Based Map, uh, and it is developed under the engagement, uh, consultancy engagement with uh, UNCCD, uh, working with Uchan Kang, uh, and uh, actually my very close collaborator, Vojan Svetkovic, uh, uh, he was uh, providing me with a lot of data and a lot of uh, uh, good comments uh, about the methodology. Uh, the main goal, uh, because this is the UNCCD, uh, was to assess uh, actually uh, the soil surface capacity to produce sand and dust storms. I must say, uh, uh, what is called here sand and dust storms, actually in the world of the numerical weather, uh, numerical dust modeling, uh, is actually what we call dust storms because dust is a predominant component uh, of this, uh, these stores, uh, storms. <clears throat> uh, uh, the definition of dust storms. Uh, is that is a uh, uh, bare topsoil surface um, very vulnerable to wind erosion uh, and under windy conditions it actually emits uh, 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 small particles uh, and it is added also or any other surface capable to emit uh, uh, small uh, uh, dust uh, or sand sized particles. Uh, the main assumption uh, is that uh, areas that include uh, uh, sources uh, have fine soil texture in their topsoil and uh, uh, are bare or sparsely vegetated. So fully vegetated surfaces, of course, will not uh, uh, be susceptible to wind erosion. Uh, they have a lower soil moisture and the, uh, these are not frozen uh, 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 soils. Uh, another definition was introduced, uh, which is what is uh, what do we call these results uh, which we map uh, here? Uh, we call it uh, source intensity. And uh, just remember that uh, what we call source intensity is actually uh, the capacity of soil surface to emit soil particles under uh, windy conditions. Uh, and the, what I will refer to as source activity is actually uh, what the, uh, depends uh, on the frequency of uh, high winds. So intensity is purely related to the characteristic of the soil surface and the sources became active if the high wind blows. 
So this is uh, two terms uh, I would like you to remember uh, for the sake of the uh, following uh, story. Uh, also, uh, uh, permanent sources uh, are called the ones that exist during the whole year. Uh, they all, of course, can change uh, their uh, intensity, but their, uh, their intensity is above zero during the whole year. And uh, dynamical sources are the ones appearing and disappearing during the year, uh, meaning uh, these are seasonal sources or, uh, as we call it, occasional sources, which appear uh, only in uh, during the extreme weather, meaning the drought conditions uh, or in high latitudes, uh, also um, uh, heat waves. Uh, uh, I have included a bunch of information in this presentation. I will not uh, say everything what is on these slides, but uh, I'm hoping that somebody who is interested in some details will later uh, read uh, uh, details about the methodology, which will, would save him some trouble in working uh, dissimilar work uh, uh, in uh, map, uh, mapping some uh, uh, dust sources. Uh, so uh, uh, at the beginning, some introduction about uh, understanding of the uh, dust storm or ascended dust storm sources. The drivers are climate conditions, uh, uh, weather conditions, uh, surface conditions, uh, meaning the characteristics uh, of uh, soil, so texture, moisture, temperature, land cover characteristics, and human activities became a very strong driver uh, for the um, uh, dust sources. Uh, where the human activities are predominant dominating driver uh, for uh, uh, sources intensity, we call it uh, anthropogenic sources. Uh, humans can have uh, indirect and uh, direct uh, impact on creation of the dust sources. Uh, direct impact uh, is changing the land cover uh, characteristics uh, uh, because of the agricultural practice uh, or uh, water scarcity, uh, deforestation, of course, this is a land cover change, but very, very meaningful in land degradation and so on, uh, fires, mining, uh, etc. Uh, indirect impact of humans uh, on creation of the dust sources uh, and impact on their the intensity is actually uh, climate change. So uh, anthropogenic climate change indirectly through the extreme events uh, can impact also creation of the sources. So all together are considered as drivers that uh, which can increase the intensity or actually produce some new, uh, uh, new uh, dust storm sources. Uh, here are some studies listed uh, that uh, uh, were actually very helpful uh, in uh, uh, which investigate uh, some uh, global, uh, biggest global uh, dust uh, storm sources uh, or uh, hotspots of the sources, uh, 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 global mapping of the sources using uh, different approaches, and also uh, uh, some references to high latitude dust sources, which are more and more. Uh, uh, popular during the recent year. Uh, this, uh, there's a wide uh, range of uh, sources uh, um, uh, scales uh, uh, some uh, and uh, the storms they produce actually some source, uh, sources uh, which are uh, usually larger uh, and have uh, high uh, actually activity uh, can uh, produce uh, global uh, dust events uh, where actually this du emitted dust uh, became a part of the global dust cycle which interacts, uh, interacts with the energy cycle or car uh, carbon global cycle or hydrology cycle uh, then then uh, we have uh, regional uh, dust storms uh, or dust events, uh, which are a large uh, scale uh, across uh, country bo boundaries and uh, between neighbor continents uh, tr uh, occurs this transport. Uh, and uh, local uh, dust storms, which are uh, of uh, relatively small scales, but very, very intense. Uh, and uh, the transport uh, is usually not far uh, from the uh, dust storm source. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> And these events uh, comprehend a large uh, scale of uh, uh, larger scales uh, of um, uh, of uh, uh, duration uh, and also the impacts uh, and uh, uh, taking into account all those drivers 
all this together must be somehow included as information in this uh, uh, newly created high resolution global dust source uh, map. Meaning that the, this map uh, must show uh, uh, impacts of uh, all drivers and uh, the wide uh, uh, range of the spatial scales uh, of the sources that exist around the globe. Uh, mapping methodologies, uh, uh, we can uh, uh, group in uh, main two groups. Um, uh, one group uh, is actually finding the sources uh, from observed uh, dust storm events or just dust events. Uh, so when uh, the dust storm occurs, then uh, the source uh, can be found. Uh, this is uh, good for synoptic overview of the major and frequently active uh, source areas uh, and uh, can recognize global and regional sources that dominate uh, in the generation of dust storms. Uh, but the setback of this methodology actually is the, that uh, the sources uh, mapped in this way uh, are not very uh, precisely uh, positioned. Uh, the uh, position is biased uh, uh, and um, uh, <clears throat> some small scales, very active sources can be missed because uh, uh, they are considered not very frequently active and the dust storms are not frequently observed. Second mapping methodology is actually uh, from data on uh, surface uh, conditions from soil data, land cover data. Uh, and uh, the advantage of this approach is actually uh, it can provide uh, high resolution uh, uh, send dust storm source patterns uh, and can find uh, relatively small, uh, uh, small scale hotspots. Uh, it can uh, <clears throat> Uh, uh, also, uh, in this way, we can include uh, all these uh, uh, small uh, sources uh, which became uh, active during some uh, extreme weather events. And the disadvantage of this uh, uh, of this approach uh, is uh, because uh, they do not include uh, the high wind data, uh, meaning that uh, we don't know uh, anything uh, uh, about the uh, activity of those sources, how frequently they emit dust. But uh, uh, we would rather leave it to uh, national uh, uh, assessments uh, uh, of the uh, or in this kind of uh, because no global data uh, of uh, uh, high resolution wind data are available, uh, nor especially none of wind gusts. Um, so, um, <clears throat> what, are, what is the, uh, the meaning of the results in these two approaches uh, is completely different. Uh, uh, when you map on the first appro approach from the observations on uh, SDS occurrence, you actually gain a map. Uh, usually, the approach is uh, to uh, count the events, average or seasonal or annual value uh, uh, level, uh, and then you actually, these uh, sources uh, of uh, center zones uh, actually show show uh, the uh, highest uh, uh, frequency of uh, SDS generation, uh, not uh, the position of uh, actually of the whole uh, source areas. Uh, the second approach, uh, using only uh, 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 surface data, um, uh, map uh, represents actually uh, the characteristic of the soil surface uh, acting as the, uh, as the dust source. So this was important uh, for uh, us. Uh, <clears throat> the best thing is to combine these both actually to map uh, using the uh, uh, surface data and then uh, uh, apply a real wind with uh, wind gusts on it uh, to run some dust mod global model with extremely high resolution, uh, but uh, we are not uh, uh, yet on, th on that level. Uh, so chosen methodology for this map is actually to map uh, all uh, dust sources uh, from data on surface conditions. Uh, so the second approach I mentioned, uh, uh, I have uh, already highlighted uh, all the benefits uh, from it. Uh, and uh, uh, on the right uh, side of this um, uh, uh, this slide is actually the, the picture uh, showing why we chose this approach. Uh, for example, uh, these dots, orange dots, are 
sources that exist. Uh, there is uh, more frequent high wind uh, uh, and the more active sources are uh, these first three, uh, which create more dense uh, uh, and more frequent uh, dust plumps. And uh, uh, from two sources, uh, uh, there is a, 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 they are less active, meaning the, uh, it is a, a lesser frequency or high winds, but they uh, emitted the dust uh, storms from these sources actually directly hit urban areas. So uh, uh, you can see the example, how would the map look like if we map from the SDS occurrence, these sources would seem insignificant, but uh, they are maybe on national level or local level more significant uh, because uh, they are, uh, the, the urban areas are vulnerable uh, to their emission. So uh, again, uh, this additionally explains why we chose actually to map uh, uh, dust sources from the uh, information on land surface uh, uh, data and find uh, this uh, special, special distribution of these dots. Uh, which data did we use? Uh, uh, data on soil characteristics, uh, soil texture. We wanted also to use uh, soil structure data, meaning uh, uh, some um, uh, organic component, uh, soil organic carbon, uh, under assumption that uh, these soils uh, are uh, better, um, less vulnerable to wind erosion. Uh, but um, global uh, data are not of high quality uh, and uh, it's hard to correlate uh, with um, emissivity, uh, soil garden combo contact uh, with uh, emissivity, and I was afraid uh, not to damage or lose some important sources. Also find some references, uh, for example, in Australia, uh, that they found uh, in dust uh, uh, storms actually the, part, uh, the high uh, uh, organic carbon content. So it's not crucial to include um, uh, data on soil structure. Uh, then land cover data we use uh, to find uh, these uh, exposed uh, bare land surfaces. Uh, uh, at the end, uh, we use uh, soil condition data, soil moisture and soil temperature. And the idea is uh, to create this global map and uh, this map would guide uh, on uh, countries on the national level uh, to select uh, critical areas and to implement uh, their uh, national analysis using their national uh, data. Uh, so it was something like a guideline uh, or for uh, countries. Uh, uh, now uh, I will go uh, to uh, uh, methodology on this uh, glo derived uh, global sand and dust storm source base map. Uh, basic information about this, uh, it is actually uh, uh, represent, I already said, uh, represents gridded uh, uh, data on 30 arc seconds resolution. Uh, it was uh, developed from um, uh, data on uh, from uh, five years uh, 2014 to 2018 uh, you will see which uh, how we manage this data and uh, which criteria were used uh, the main product is uh, dust stores yeah, or, or what is called here sand and dust stores intensity ranging from zero to one um, uh, then um, um, what is more, uh, this is important, uh, uh, to save computational time, uh, we did not use all the data for this uh, five years period. Uh, why this five years period is chosen? Because at the time uh, we work uh, on this uh, in 2019 uh, and the last year for which we had uh, uh, data was 2018 and actually these five years are globally uh, uh, warmest uh, uh, on record uh, and also contain uh, all relevant uh, extreme weather events that we want to catch and bring into our map. Uh, 
Uh, also, uh, we use uh, uh, the data for four representative months from for January, April, July, and October. January is the coldest on northern hemisphere and warmest on the southern hemisphere. April is a month uh, when vegetation starts to develop on northern hemisphere and then decrease on southern hemisphere. July is warmest on the northern hemisphere, coldest on the southern hemisphere, and so on. So you will you see the point. These formats are crucial, and uh, the assumption is they will uh, well represent uh, the dynamics uh, of the uh, uh, dust storm sources during the year. Uh, what is important to mention here, if the, here uh, are also uh, people that are not um, uh, modelers, uh, in uh, our definition of sand and dust storms, uh, we say that, that uh, a source is a fraction of soil that is exposed to wind erosion. Uh, uh, and uh, the, if this fraction of soil contains a plant, it is not a source. If it's barren, it is a source. But when we look at one grid box of this map or some area the, which corresponds to this grid box, it can, it can have plants on it or some water bodies and also uh, bare land or exposed areas to wind erosion. So it's a mixture. So uh, what we actually uh, uh, in one grid box, we want to find the percentage of the exposed area to wind erosion. Uh, and uh, when we say uh, this grid box is dust source, it cannot, uh, it doesn't man mean it has to be fully barren. It can be also sparse, uh, pa uh, partially vegetated uh, or contain some water bodies. Uh, so uh, the priority in the detecting as the sources is actually to have a good soil texture information and a good representation of the percentage of the free uh, or bare. Uh, uh, soil surface without vegetation, um, without snow or ice cover, uh, without uh, any water bodies over it, and uh, to have, um, and also it needs to be not frozen. So this is why we call it a free surface, surface with free particles uh, susceptible to uh, wind uh, erosion. Um, the challenge is to have actually to produce good soil texture data. You will see the complication later. Uh, and the second challenge is actually uh, to define the percentage of the free surface uh, area. Um, how we use here uh, two soil texture, global soil texture databases and uh, applied also some correction factors function to obtain the, uh, to increase the contribution from uh, uh, topographical pits uh, under assumption that actually this topographical pits contains um, uh, small uh, fine particles more than other areas. Uh, so this needs to, uh, to be enhanced somehow on global level. Uh, two databases on soil texture, which uh, we use, is actually ISRIT's uh, International Soil Reference and Information Center uh, uh, database uh, so from soil grids. Uh, it uh, uh, has uh, clay, silt, uh, and sand percents uh, of, uh, on different depths of the soil, uh, very convenient for our use. Uh, and uh, another database is actually StatsGoFAL uh, database, uh, uh, which uh, contains uh, USDA soil texture types, uh, not directly the percentages of clay, silt, and sand, but uh, uh, the categories uh, of the soil textures. Uh, so, uh, if you want to use this kind of map, we need numbers, the percentages of uh, fine particles. So, this second uh, data were transferred into the percentages uh, in this way. Uh, it was compared, stats go foul, with this uh, first data set. Uh, if uh, the percentages correspond to uh, uh, this uh, category, uh, USDA uh, uh, soil texture type on this specific site, uh, uh, the percentages are uh, adopted from this first database. If they do not correspond to this uh, specific uh, this site uh, to USDA soil texture type. Uh, the percentages are a little bit shift minimal to 
uh, in, uh, to um, satisfy uh, the soil texture type um, criteria. Uh, so actually using the first information, we created percentages uh, for the second uh, uh, global data. Uh, why? Why did we use the two, the two uh, uh, soil texture databases? I will show you just an example here. This is a, a very uh, famous uh, Bodella depression uh, source, okay, in uh, Africa, uh, uh, very uh, famous dust source uh, and important on global level. Uh, so uh, you uh, see on the left side here, uh, the circle for the Tibesti mountains on the north and Bodella depression. And uh, uh, on the right side, you see at the upper panel, uh, the first uh, map showing the uh, fine particles con content, clay plus silt. Uh, as you can see over the mountains, it show, show uh, high content and uh, in Bodella depression, very low content. Uh, this uh, version is updated, so maybe they changed this. But this was a problem. Below 10% of silk and clay cannot emit such a large dust storms uh, going around uh, uh, to other continents, okay? Uh, the second map, uh, which is usually in, um, uh, included in the weather or dust forecast models, uh, is shown on the bottom, and uh, you can see it's uh, sandy uh, soils and loam. The loam actually uh, have over 50% of fine particles. So obviously there is a big difference. So somehow uh, it was very uh, we needed to reduce uh, the uh, and there is a bedrock over the mountain areas, so no sources there. So somehow we need to reverse the situation. Uh, increase in bed, uh, Bodella depression values of fine particles and decrease over the mountains. And uh, also we have vice versa problems in other parts of the world. This is just an example. So uh, you can see here how uh, fine particles content from Israel soil texture database looks like uh, and from stats go foul transferred into the percentages of fine particles. So these two data sets, you can see the difference between them. And uh, at first, these are averaged. So we have, uh, of, uh, actually have uh, the average soil texture uh, data from these two maps. Addition, then we needed to create correction function. Correction function was based on the uh, uh, S-function approach. We call it X-function, actually Genou called it erodibility function uh, from his paper, in, uh, of, uh, their paper actually uh, published in 2001. Uh, and uh, it is actually a good trick uh, to calculate top, uh, topographical pits, contribution from topographical pits. So uh, the pit has a higher uh, S function value and uh, the peak, uh, topographical peak actually has a lower. Uh, so this is what is uh, obtained uh, in this paper uh, on one degree resolution, uh, applying uh, the S function uh, on the grid box of the size uh, 10 by 10 degrees. So it was um, uh, very coarse, but very good to estimate the main global dust storm sources and it well corresponded with satellite observations. So this approach we used, but we used uh, uh, several calculations uh, with, uh, on high resolution, on one kilometer resolution, actually 30 arc seconds in every point from the four grid boxes, we calculated four S functions to catch the large size pits and small size pits. And the average value of these uh, S functions uh, uh, we used to create a correction function for the clay and uh, uh, silt uh, category uh, for the clay and silt content. So with this, actually, we enhanced um, uh, fine particles content in areas which are topographical pits from large scale to small scale pits. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, so on the, this big picture is actually what you get uh, uh, for fine particles co content globally when you apply uh, this correction function uh, on uh, clean silt and clay, and uh, this is uh, the the silt plus clay map. 
Uh, the sand was corrected like uh, you correct silt, you correct uh, 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 clay, and what the rest of it is sand. Uh, one important note. Uh, meantime, uh, uh, the glaciers melted, uh, the many lakes were dried or rivers, and uh, we do not usually do not have uh, soil texture data uh, there, over there. So uh, these areas where we recognized that they are dried or, or uh, that are ex newly exposed surfaces, um, uh, we need to fill in. So we uh, filled in with uh, a nearest point value. So also dried uh, lake beds uh, or uh, surfaces appeared uh, from Gracious Retriever are also included in this map. So how does it look for the, the Bodella depression? Uh, <clears throat> you can see the ends function has a high values in Bodella depression. Correction function looks like you need to multiply your values of uh, fine texture uh, uh, classes uh, uh, with values above one, even above three, meaning it needs to be enhanced. And on the mountain area below one, uh, is correction function meaning that uh, the values will be reduced. Uh, the soil texture, which is average value of these uh, two databases, uh, is shown below. Uh, and uh, on the right side uh, is the result. When you apply correction functions on soil texture, what you get. And you will see that uh, actually we managed to uh, obtain uh, 50 to 60 percent in some areas of Bodella depression, the fine particles content. Um, uh, soil moisture and soil temperature data were used from ECNWF uh, analysis on 25 kilometer resolution and uh, they're transferred into the uh, 30 seconds resolution using nearest point value. The data were for these four months for the period of selected five years. Uh, and what is important here to notice is that uh, uh, soil moisture data um, are select, uh, we used uh, from soil moisture data the minimum soil moisture for each month. So we want to uh, have the driest possible uh, soil conditions included in our map. And it is used to create soil moisture factor for reducing the uh, emission impact, which impacts actually the reduction of emission uh, <clears throat> then soil temperature data, uh, from, so, uh, from soil temperature data, uh, we used maximum possible values for these four months uh, because we want to catch all uh, possible not frozen surfaces which can contribute to uh, uh, dust storm, creation of dust storms or blowing dust. And this is used to create temperature freezing factor, actually, actually temperature wind combination with moisture, the temperature threshold when the soil freezes. And if the temperatures are above this, the soil is considered not frozen and the emission is possible. Uh, more this EVI data are used, uh, uh, their minimum values. Uh, so the minimum land, uh, we search for the minimum vegetation uh, cover, minimum positive values, uh, were used from this uh, four months data from these five years. Uh, and with this, uh, we actually consider the maximum possible bare land fracture for each grid point. Uh, support to the EVI in house vegetation index data uh, is more this land cover data because uh, there could be some uh, uh, false uh, signals in EVI data. So we use land cover data to um, uh, actually clean uh, these false uh, signals uh, and uh, support uh, this data for bare land representation, cropland, uh, grassland, and open shrublands. These categories are considered as possible dust productive. And uh, these two MODIS data are used to uh, determine their land fraction. So how do we uh, map, how do we, this is, um, create this dust sort of map? It is impossible to, to apply a layering approach uh, uh, on um, 
uh, to create this map, uh, we needed to run the dust uh, uh, emission scheme in each green point of the world for each month for each uh, pa uh, particle category. So this is like a large algorithm. Uh, what is important here is uh, that uh, we have uh, Berland uh, fraction uh, uh, defined, we have uh, not frozen surfaces defined, uh, we have soil moisture factor uh, defined, uh, mean, uh, what is uh, the problem with this? Uh, most of us use uh, FECAN from 1999 uh, reference uh, uh, assumption on uh, impact of soil moisture on uh, threshold uh, friction velocity, actually threshold uh, windy conditions needed uh, for um, uh, emission of the dust. Uh, if the dust, uh, if uh, the soil moisture is higher, then uh, the threshold uh, uh, is also higher. But it works uh, up to some point, uh, up to 0 0.15 uh, soil moisture, and we needed uh, for mo more moist soils to introduce additional factor to reduce the emission, because from the moist soils the emission is possible, uh, but reduced, so we don't want to lose also uh, the wetter soils uh, as a source. Um, the scheme uh, is uh, uh, also uh, ran uh, for clay, silt and sand particles uh, and uh, the total emitted concentration was calculated, but uh, then we needed some, these numbers don't mean anything, uh, they need to be normalized somehow and re reduced to values from zero to one. Uh, so uh, for each month was calculated 99th percentile of all values uh, of all uh, sources uh, and this uh, using this value the normalization was performed and uh, for the uh, values uh, when, when actually all values are divided with values of 99 percent if we obtained the values above one we set it to one and one uh, of uh, sources intensity is for sources which are top 1% of dust productive areas on the world. And the ones with close to zero cannot produce maybe dust storms, but some blowing dust events. Uh, these are more, uh, here are listed more uh, details about parameterization introduced in this emission scheme to obtain this uh, global dust source map. So if everyone is interested in how some, uh, find, uh, some, how some things I tuned can read this uh, slide. Uh, so here are the results. Um, uh, these are uh, uh, sources intensity uh, for each month separately. Uh, so it shows also the seasonal variability uh, of the sources and uh, the position of the permanent sources. Uh, then uh, all other versions of the map uh, are actually derived from these two. So what you want to see, you combine the data. So this is, for example, the map of annual sources, sources that exist during the whole year, but also can change their intensity and the average value of their intensity. Some of them do not change intensity, some of them change a little bit, but during the whole year is, is above zero. So uh, comparing to the patterns of, uh, as you know, from 2001 and from 2012, which is obtained from the, uh, uh, dust, optical uh, dust optical depth data, it actually corresponds well. But now you can see uh, these uh, small uh, features of the sources. Uh, these are the minimum and the maximum values on annual level from these five years, of course, uh, of sources. And you can see uh, a lot of area uh, is possible additionally to appear during some season or during extreme weather events and to act as dust sources. Uh, so uh, on the right hand side is actually the dynamical part of the sources, how much they can change uh, uh, during the year. Uh, this is a simple view of the map. Uh, here are highlighted the high intensity sources above 0 0.5. So if I would look for my dust storm sources, I would uh, in general 
uh, searching for task, uh, look at the sources which have intensity of above 0 0.5. Uh, these can generate uh, dust storms, uh, and the uh, the sources with lower intensity can generate maybe more blowing dust events. But they are important to exist because uh, their cumulative uh, emissions uh, over some wider area can be significant. Also, it is created a simple map, uh, which also has included. Uh, uh, in some way, the type of the sources. Uh, is it a cropland? Uh, is it grassland? Because of the impact of agriculture uh, or some other type of the sources, uh, it is important but because if you, can, if you see that uh, there is a high intensity grassland uh, or uh, cropland uh, uh, source, uh, then uh, you can doubt uh, on uh, uh, hu human negative impact uh, to land degradation uh, in these uh, areas and the uh, intervention is actually needed. So there are some places uh, uh, that which correspond like uh, in Ukraine when they have appearing dust storms uh, and actually it's a red area for, in this map for cropland type of sources. So it should give you actually first guess where this land degradation uh, happens. And uh, at the end, I'm showing you uh, uh, results for uh, uh, high latitudes. All these previous maps are drawn uh, every 10th point because it would be impossible for me to, to draw so many uh, pictures. They would be huge on one kilometer resolutions. Uh, special files were created to, uh, to uh, draw global maps. Every tenth uh, point uh, uh, is used, uh, but here you can see in more details uh, high latitude sources. Uh, the I would call this uh, maximum possible uh, uh, areas which can emit dust. Uh, because uh, we were targeting uh, also, uh, besides seasonals, also extreme weather events. So uh, this may correspond to the some uh, future, uh, to the period uh, if this trend of climate change uh, uh, continues, to some future spatial coverage of dust sources on the north. They, they would increase, I mean, uh, because of the uh, the, the, the main thing is that uh, soil stays unfrozen during the uh, no snow or uh, no vegetation uh, cover period. Uh, here are some also notes, uh, important notes. Uh, I would highlight about this global map that the largest uncertainty in the results is actually over grasslands uh, for low intensity. Uh, sources maybe uh, the EVI index uh, 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 have uh, low values uh, for brown grass uh, surfaces and it's, it is not exposed, it has some vegetation, so somewhat the, the, the emission would be um, reduced. Uh, you can notice when you enlarge those data some spatial inconsistency of data, uh, some lines, uh, jumping values, but this is normal when uh, working uh, in uh, uh, applying some numerical uh, artificial calculations on the natural data. Uh, and also the low resolution of soil moisture and soil temperature data. Uh, not very nice interpolation, high resolution was, uh, we did not have time to perform. Uh, but um, uh, for the risk assessment uh, from uh, and uh, to decide uh, which uh, are critical dust sources from the hum for the human livelihood, we uh, actually is left on national level to decide because uh, uh, also, socioeconomic data are needed, and um, what is important to imp uh, it would be the best if we can actually run the dust model on high resolutions with the dynamical component, uh, uh, with dynamics of the source is always changing and updated uh, with uh, regularly update with. Uh, Data. But uh, for now, it is impossible. Uh, using uh, this approach in numerical dust transport modeling, uh, using these map, maps uh, is not advised. Actually, you can use this kind of methodology. Dust source map is not a fixed information, nor it is fixed 
on seasonal monthly level. So it uh, should be updated uh, uh, every month with co land cover data and of course soil moisture and soil temperature uh, it receives from the model itself. Uh, the only actually fixed information is actually information on soil texture. So that's it for me. Um, thank you very much, Anna. Um, so um, I would like to, to remind to all of the participants that you still have some time to um, ask any questions uh, for Anna in using the question box. Um, so uh, we already have some, some questions and some comments, so we can start with that. So Sayed Omid Nabavi uh, is asking uh, if, uh, Anna, if you could mention um, the source and reliability of your soil data on, on global level and basically how, how do you check the source and the reliability? Uh, of, uh, of which data? Uh, of soil of texture? Your, so, soil data. He's, he's saying soil data. Uh, well, uh, so, soil data, if uh, it is meant on soil texture data, uh, this uh, first thesis database uh, is actually derived from all collected information and, um, uh, and uh, uh, some, uh, th there is a paper on, on that or papers uh, applied with uh, this uh, uh, machine learning uh, approach uh, to generate uh, these nice uh, maps. Uh, so uh, I would say, and this second is actually used for years in weather forecast modeling. Uh, there, there are some parts when one where one database is better than the other. Uh, for sure, this first database is on finer resolution uh, than the second one, uh, but uh, in some areas it have problems. And also the second one, say, here's some problems. So there is no unique global uh, uh, soil texture information that are reliable everywhere. Uh, this is why, uh, because uh, all countries do not have uh, soil sampling uh, infor uh, information gathered from uh, uh, enough soil sampling, uh, or they do not uh, share uh, uh, internationally. Uh, so uh, it is what it is. Uh, what uh, this correction function is applied uh, to somehow increase the contribution of uh, what we know uh, are good. Uh, dust sources uh, areas and uh, the results corresponded well uh, of what we know according to our experience that are uh, good uh, dust sources. So um, the other uh, soil data, uh, EVI, land cover data, I think they are very reliable. Uh, to use for mapping uh, and um, uh, okay, soil moisture and soil temperature data are derived from the ECMF uh, reanalysis. It also the quality also depends on the international exchange uh, of uh, data. So somewhere uh, it works very well, somewhere uh, not that much well. In some occasions it works well, in somewhere not well. But I think it's the best choice, or maybe. Uh, some noir analysis uh, could serve the purpose that it is one are higher uh, available in high resolutions uh, and we were in a hurry so uh, we used the ECMFW data. Great. Um, so um, the next question is coming from OT Mainander. Uh, well, first he's congratulating you for the great work. And uh, he's also asking if you could clarify a bit more how the anthropogenic sources appear in the map versus the natural sources. And uh, he's asking if you can pick the anthropogenic data separately. Uh, well, uh, this is what UNCCD also asked. Uh, the best thing uh, uh, we could do at the time is actually using MODIS land cover data and to search for um, uh, cropland areas. Uh, using five years of land cover data, uh, we search for all cropland areas and overlap it uh, with, um, uh, with uh, our sources. Then we know if it is cropland and it is high intensity source, then it is anthropogenic impact. 
so uh, this is one thing. This can be separated like in this map, uh, especially these red areas. Of course, when you enlarge the map, you would see a lot of more uh, points, uh, I must say. Looking at the global high-resolution map on one slide is not, means nothing. And also, uh, uh, some um, for uh, as we all know, livestock breeding uh, can uh, impact significantly on pastures, uh, like uh, in Mongolia, for example. And this is why we searched in five years for a widest extension of grasslands and overlap it with sources. So where sources exist and there is a grassland area, maybe we can assume this is also because of the human impact. And besides that, no, uh, it would be better. We need maybe some other global data on distribution of industry, of, uh, um, of uh, agricultural practice or, or something that. And when you overlap it with dust storm sources, then you can distinguish maybe better some anthropogenic sources. OK, thank you, Anna. Um, another question from, from Oti um, concerns the, the update and the, um, and the add of new sources that appear after 2018. Um, so he's asking if, if you have any, any plan concerning this aspect. Uh, well, uh, there is no plan in updating the, uh, this map. Uh, uh, this is why the approach was to go to maximum things to search for the mech, or in five years to maximum temperature to find all unfrozen land during uh, uh, winter or spring or something uh, when they're usually uh, frozen. Also going into the uh, selecting the driest possible conditions, uh, uh, or the conditions with lowest possible vegetation, so pushing into this uh, maximum and uh, pushing these uh, extreme values of our uh, data, uh, uh, we actually made a map that will consider uh, most of the surface in the uh, most of the dust sources in the future, uh, meaning that including extreme values. Uh, extreme favorable values which detect favor favorable uh, conditions for uh, dust sources uh, in these five years would comprehend what also happens in the next years. If we use, for example, average temperature data or average moisture data, we would need uh, uh, urgently an update. But with using extreme values, I think uh, this is why I did it in this way. I knew that th there would be no update, so the, this map would stand, I don't know, in the future years. So this is why the extreme values were included under assumption that probably on a larger scale, no extremes would be pushed that would impact appearance of the new sources. Okay, uh, the next question is coming from Paul Genou, and he is asking if you take into consideration snow cover. Yes, of course. Yes, we took into consideration the snow cover. Uh, actually, at first we made a um, mistake look, looking at EVI data because of uh, no wide uh, experience in uh, snowy regions. Uh, but uh, uh, yes, of course, uh, uh, the, uh, we also uh, uh, considered the minimum uh, snow uh, cover uh, which exists, uh, uh, the minimum snow cover in five years, assuming uh, that uh, a reduction of snow cover will happen in the future. Uh, and um, there was, uh, uh, I think there was a problem also for us, uh, uh, when you have uh, some mixture of snow and forest, uh, it would uh, uh, impact the EVI or uh, also uh, 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 some problems, uh, small problems appeared uh, in uh, uh, using EVI data 
on such surfaces, but we uh, managed to fight this problem. And uh, this is uh, in the text, in the report, and also uh, the methodology on this uh, slide I skipped, and I said there, uh, there is more uh, information. So yes, we took uh, all uh, possible uh, uh, all possible uh, land cover types uh, and took the all possible uh, bare land uh, fractions uh, into the consideration. And also the, the, the what dried in the meantime, uh, like for example, Ar Aral Lake uh, and some other smaller lakes we needed also to consider and to fill in with uh, additional soil texture data. Okay, great. Uh, Eleni Drakaki is asking um, if we can have access on the map and how? Well, uh, the map uh, uh, should be available uh, the, through the UNCCD portal. I forgot to include the link. You see my shared screen. I think it's maps, you can see. So this is a SDS source map. But still there is not enough uh, uh, explanation about the map. This was my chance actually to explain everything possible about this methodology, about uh, the results, uh, because still report is not available. Mm, and uh, there should be on this link available data for download. In the meantime, if you need data, you can write to me so I can uh, send you. I must say, uh, I must admit actually that uh, data are here organized in old school level in tiles. Let me just show you if somebody is interested. I have open tab here if you remember. Sorry, sorry. Actually, the data are in old school format uh, of these tiles. This is somehow. Uh, before uh, how the data were stored uh, in numerical weather forecast models. So I have data in this form of tiles uh, in Graz uh, files. They're huge, so I can send you the part you wish to okay. analyze. Uh, Anna, if, if you would like, you can also share with us the link and, and we can later, I mean, after the webinar, we can share it with all participants um so they mm -hmm. they have it on hand um okay it's four o'clock sharp so i will just uh, proceed to a final question to one more question um so um svetlana zero uh, is asking uh if you could I clarify think, Constantina, if you yes. if i can interrupt you i think that is a common question uh, that how the chemical transport models can use this nice data set that you produce for, for their simulations to regional or local scales? This is the main question. Okay. I mean, yes. I can see different participants that are asking the same thing. It's feasible to use this data set for local and regional air quality runs? This should be... Well, uh... mm. As I said, uh, I, I don't know how, how these uh, chemical models uh, works like, uh, I mean, if you think on uh, no matter uh, coupled better chemical uh, models, uh, then uh, as I said, uh, uh, it should, uh, they should include uh, EVI information, they should include uh, updated, they should this should include the bare land inf uh, uh, information, or actually the MODIS data, uh, then uh, uh, parameterizations related to soil temperature, soil moisture, uh, emission. Uh, Sara, do, uh, these chemical models have dust component, yeah? They are talking about uh, referring CIMAC, IMEP, or WORFCAM, for example. 
would I would yeah, suggest yeah, yeah. They, they have yeah, yeah. Yeah. I would suggest just the 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 source to introduce different approach in uh, in, uh, in source uh, recognition. I mean, no fixed map. I mean, they can use these fixed maps. Uh, uh, and uh, in, include uh, uh, include um, soil moisture impact, soil temperature uh, impact. Uh, it is not a problem. Uh, uh, these are like some maximum soil uh, dust source maps, uh, and uh, regular update uh, would uh, uh, decrease in, cer in certain areas where is needed the emission. But I would rather advise uh to actually implement this methodology so to uh, so model regularly update their own dust source map if you know what i mean uh you just implement the methodology soil texture uh, build your own um, uh, bare land fraction uh, using the latest evi modis data uh, uh soil temperature data moisture data it's it's not that hard Okay, um, thank you, Anna. Um, well, it's uh, shortly after four, so I think we should call it a day. Um, we will um, we will share with you, all of the participants the, the link to the link that Anna shared before, and uh, we will also share with uh, with the speaker any comments that you might have left during the session and that we didn't have uh, time to address. Um, so, uh, thank you very much, Anna, for being with us today. Um, and I would, uh, I would take this opportunity to, to share with you um, the information about the next webinar the ne uh, organized by Indust. It's in two weeks, the 5th of May. Our speaker will be Xavier Querol, and he will talk about uh, um, how how mineral dust matters when assessing the health effects so um thank you very much for for being with us today and we hope to see you again in two weeks thank you bye bye bye, bye.